may think of the history passed down from our families as anecdotes unrelated to the here and now. If we're willing to dig a bit deeper, however, we may find patterns that enlighten our present and can even alter the course of our future. Joining me today is Greg Francis, attorney and author of the book, Just Harvest. Greg's book is a prime example of how taking the time to listen to and share the stories of those frequently marginalized can lead to justice and positive change. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for joining me today. This is a great episode on sharing your story and you did just that. Tell us about yourself and tell us about the, the lawsuit that led to your book. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me today. Um, the, uh, the lawsuit that led to me writing the book uh, involved the discrimination against black farmers uh, historically for tens of, for about 20 years. Um, we, uh, we understand that, you know, after slavery, many of the slaves, the only trade they knew was farming. Therefore, after the Emancipation Proclamation, many of the slaves went into farming. Uh, at that same time, the uh, United States of America Department of Agriculture was created in order to prop up and ensure that America could be the viable country that it was growing into. Um, part of the, the, the purpose of the USDA would be to support farmers to ensure that there was a steady flow of food to the tables all across America. Uh, unfortunately, um, those, while there was a change in legislation, meaning the Emancipation Proclamation, there was not a change of heart by those who were um, obligated to implement now this, this program. So for tens of years, black farmers would be denied loans and other um, relief that other white farmers would be getting. And it really led to a great decline in the number of black farmers that um, are, you know, actually farming today. In 1920, there were approximately 960,000 black farmers. By the time I got involved in the case, there was less than 40,000 black farmers. Oh, wow, what a huge difference. So uh, many of these, you know, they, be, being unable to compete being unable to market, to expand as uh, their white counterparts were allowed to, these farmers just left and did something else. And what led to the discrimination of that, that funding? Um, as I said, you know, there was a change in legislation, meaning the Emancipation Proclamation. Slavery was no longer legal. However, the same folks who had enslaved uh, the, the, the slaves were the ones who are now put in charge of disseminating this money. And really, mm -hmm. the reality is that their feelings about the, um, the slaves or the former slaves at this point had not changed at all. And they still thought them as not equal to um, the rest of the farmers. So they were discriminating based on who they were giving the funding to. And so that's why there was a difference in funding. Right, right, exactly. Uh, you know, for instance, pure discrimination. A, right, a, a black farmer would come in for a loan. Many times in my discussions with the farmers, um, they may know that their funds available because one of their white uh, neighbors said, "Hey, I just went down and got a loan, you know, um, operating loan for this year." So they would go down to the same office that the white farmer went to, and be denied. It was sometimes as blatant as throwing the application away in their face. Sometimes they'd be given the runaround, told to go to different offices all around, um, or just delayed the, the funding itself. And if you know, when you know something about farming, timing is everything. And crops have to be planted by a certain time in order to uh, reap a, a good harvest. And from that experience and that lawsuit, what led you to turning it into a book? Uh, you know, this, this, this lawsuit happened... Um, uh, the initial lawsuit was in the late 90s. Uh, we that the, the portion of the lawsuit I was involved in occurred around 2010, actually 2008. In the Farm Bill, there was created a section for to address the, the discrimination of the black farmers, which the USDA, by the way, had done their own investigation and found themselves that there was widespread discrimination. So I initially got involved in the case working in Mississippi on really another case, and I kept getting these calls uh, from black farmers. Ultimately, some farmers drove one a set of brothers, one from Oklahoma, one from Texas, drove and told me their story, and I was just moved by the story. I initially did not believe it because 
you know, we're in two thousands and, um, and this type of discrimination had gone on and was continuing to go on. You know, ultimately I got involved in the case and, uh, you know, I was a voice for the farmers, uh, blessed to be a voice for the farmers in the courtroom. Uh, but they, you know, one of the things that I realized they really wanted is to be heard for people to understand their story and their plight and what they've been through uh, and why there had been such a decrease in the amount of black farmers. And I thought, what better way to do it than actually put it in a book? Yeah, definitely. It really does get the, give them a platform right. where their story could get out there. Right. What was that process like writing a book based on your experience? You know, the, the it was a new experience for me. I'd never written a book before. I'd never really thought about writing a book. Uh, I was uh, preparing for commercials one day and started talking to the the gentleman who was producing my uh, commercials, and he asked me about the case. And one question led to another. And after about three or four hours of a discussion between he and I, that was that was taped and filmed. Um, he said, "I think you have a book." Never thought of that before. He contacted a publisher who very quickly agreed, and uh, there we went. Um, there was a lot of research that went into the book, you know, a lot of sleepless nights trying to make sure you get as much information in as possible. And, you know, one of the things I learned is after writing this book, there's a bunch more to be said, you know, uh, and you just you, you're not always able to get it all in. Yeah. Were there things cut out of the book that you wanted in or were you given as much leeway to add as much information as you needed? Right. Yeah, I was given as much creative uh, freedom to do uh, and say everything I needed to say or what that I wanted to say. However, you know, it's it's a limited book and, uh, you know, there are only so many pages. And um, it's my perspective on, you know, dealing with this lawsuit and the farmers and that type of thing. And others may have different perspectives. And I realize that now. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's just something that, you know, you learn by writing a book. So this book is from your perspective where you kind of feel I'm hearing that there could be more books on the same story, but from someone else's perspective. Absolutely. You know, my perspective is as lead counsel for the uh, for the farmers, which which means I was the lawyer for the lawyers. Um, and I kind of directed what the other lawyers did in the case dealt directly with the judge, but it was my perspective. You know, there were other lawyers who were involved in the case, obviously farmers who had different experiences, um, officials from the USDA that may have had a different different uh, perspective. Um, but it is, you know, it is my perspective. And, you know, that's something you learn in writing a book is you can't please everyone, you know, and everyone may not agree with your recitation of the facts or how things happened. And I had to get comfortable with, look, this is this is what I saw. This is my perspective. Yeah. And there's always critics, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> Certainly always critics. How was it working with your agent as a publisher? Uh, again, a new experience for me. A lot of deadlines that were put in front of me. And um, I, I usually march to the beat of my own drum. So it took a, some adjustment in order to be able to deal with and, you know, uh, meet the deadlines of the of the publishers. Did they provide you any support? Like a, a proofreader, editor, or what kind sure. of Sure, we, we had an support? editor and a proofreader, and I had some help. Um, uh, I had a staff that helped me do a lot of the research that was necessary uh, mm -hmm. for the book as well. You know, the book is kind of broken up into three parts. The first part is, is a short memoir on my life, uh, and the second part of the book is really a history of black farming in America, and then the last part of the book is about the actual case. Oh, I like that. So the, the, the middle portion where we went through really the history of legislation, what was passed, what was intended, that type of thing, there was a lot of research that went into that. Was there an advance that they, well, let me just explain what advance is just in case any of your viewers yeah. don't know. An advance is like a payment that maybe the publisher will provide to a writer to like get them started and financially support them while they're writing the book. Yeah, I wish <laughs> <laughs> that that was not done in my case. Um, as a first time author, um, that's not that's not usually done. However, I will tell you that there were uh, several major real retailers who agreed to buy the book even before it was done, uh, which, according to my publisher, had never happened to him before for a first time author oh, wow. um, uh, since he's been in the business. Well, congratulations. Thank you. That. Thank you. <laughs> What support does the publisher provide when it comes to marketing and selling your book? Um, you, you know, we, we have been engaged with um, platform creators who, is con who are kind of our agents um, and have led much of the marketing. 
But in addition to that, I'm doing exactly what we're doing today, sitting down with interviews with different segments of the of the population um, and, and really nationwide, some TV shows, some radio shows, some blogs, uh, that type of thing. Are you already getting some payments from the books that help you do that to go around tour? Because it does take up your time and maybe right. away from right. your work that you were. Right. Well, it's certainly taken me away from my work, but it's also. Or your day job, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it takes me away from my day job. Uh, we are starting to get some of the proceeds in from the book. But, you know, to be honest with you, the, the proceeds that we're making from the book are being put into a foundation, the Greg Francis Just Harvest Foundation, mm -hmm. in order to promote um, having um, young folks getting involved in agriculture, along with John Rivers, um, who's building a farm here in, in Central Florida, you know, getting exposure to kids at the high school level mm -hmm. in order for them to become familiar with and interested in agriculture is one of the things. I, I, I have also um, endowed a scholarship at the University of Florida College of Law, which is what my alma mater, uh, to provide 10 scholarships for graduates of HBCUs uh, every year to attend the University of Florida. And then finally, I work with a, uh, a local church here, uh, David uh, Jock, the Kingdom Church, where I have invested into their housing, uh, refurbishing of housing, transitional housing for members of the community who will come and live there for six months, get education on um, budgeting, uh, mortgages, um, you know, th those type of things. And, uh, and then at the end of those six months, the, the money that they paid every month in rent is given back to them for those six months. And, you know, with the premise that, or the hope that those folks will take that money that they've saved and the knowledge that they've earned over the six months and become homeowners themselves. Oh, that's great. So you're giving back every, is right. everything? Right. Yeah. Everything. Yeah, everything. Wow. So, uh, you know, I think it's important to invest in the community. Mm -hmm. Community certainly been good to me here. I'm originally from uh, Panama and Central America. When I came here to Orlando, it was a little sleepy, sleepy town. I didn't, I didn't speak English very well. Um, but along the way, there were always people in the community, even outside of my family, that kind of assisted me and helped me boost me along to the next level, to the next, uh, next task. And I just feel an obligation in my in myself to do the same thing. That's very commendable. Thank you. Thank you. What advice would you give someone who wants to share their story and write a book? I think the first thing to do is um, is actually sit down. Just even if if it's your own camera or whatever, sit down and just start talking about it and talk it through. Um, talk through the points that you want to make in the book, uh, kind of a format of the book, and then go back and look at it and evaluate, you know, these points are good, these points are bad, I wanna switch this around in terms of the order of things. Um, but I think that the first stage is really, you probably need, you know, three to four hours of just sitting and talking about what the, what the purpose of the book would or what information you're gonna put in the book. Is there anything else you would like to leave our readers with? Well, I mean, just to say that, you know, Just Harvest is a it's a history. It's a book on American history uh, and it's available on Amazon uh, at Target and Target dot com. So but thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for for being here and, and sharing your story. No, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Really appreciate right. it.